Yeah. Mm. First of all, thank you uh, to the organizers for having me here. It's very nice to be in India. Uh, today, I'd like to tell you about this work, recent work with Dominic Els and Philip on long-lived interacting phases of matter protected by multiple time translation, translation symmetries in quasi product driven systems. It's a very long title, and uh, I don't have much time, so I'll try to be quick, but pedagogical as well. So if you have questions, uh, you can ask, but I'll try to you know, also be quick about this. So what is this work about? This work is really about asking the question of what can a lack of thermalization do for you if you have some structure in time? So suppose that you have some driven system that, you have, um, that you're that you driving and it has a certain structure in time which we interpret as symmetries together, together with a description of a lack of um, thermalization or some slow heating result. Then we can say what kind of new phases of matter we can get. And these are phases of matter that we'll be interested, interested in which are not related to equilibrium phases of matter, which are distinct from what you can get in static systems. So just as a very quick overview, so um, we are very familiar with the um, phases of matter, which are the collective emergent properties of many body systems. And as you know, as we tune one parameter, we can get solids, liquids, and they are sharply distinct. Um, concept of symmetries play a very important role here because the symmetries tell you exactly what different phases they are. There's an order parameter that, that um, denotes or distinguishes between the two of them. And this is a Landau paradigm. And this gives rise to crystals, ferromagnets, and so on and so forth. And recently, there's the concept of topology uh, together with symmetries, where you can have um, this quantum phases of matter, which has patterns of long-range entanglement, distinguished with symmetries, and which gives give rise to the same phases, such as um, TIs or spin liquids, which are in the symmetry-protected topological and symmetry-enriched topological classes. So now we want to ask a question. Can we have also phases of matter in non-equilibrium settings? So traditionally, what I've talked about are usually phases in equilibrium settings where uh, the system is at some, some thermal equilibrium. And so how do we get non-equilibrium phases matter? Now this seems very generic because you can take the system out of equilibrium in many, many ways, but we want, so at least I will focus on some um, particular uh, classes where there is a minimal generalization of this concept and I will tell you something, about, something universal about um, what can happen in situations like this. So the, the first step is to, of course, um, one way of getting something out of, out of equilibrium is to remove the buff. So let's, let's say that we are looking at closed, isolated quantum antibody systems evolving under its own unitary dynamics. And suppose that we can also consider external driving on the system. For example, Floquet, or even beyond Floquet, which is the, the premise of this work currently. So now you can ask, if the system is undergoing unitary time um, dynamics, is this sufficient to give rise to fundamentally non-equilibrium phases of matter? Um, so, well, before I answer the question, I, I should also say that um, such considerations are very natural because uh, nowadays, um, very good experimental control of isolated um, quantum systems of trapped ions, cold atoms, and um, superconducting qubits, solid state defects, have allowed us to realize such systems um, in the lab. Um, and th these systems have very long coherence times, uh, are very well isolated from the, from the environment, and so the interactions are the, are the predominant time scale or predominant interactions uh, that, that govern what happens in the system. Okay, so I pose a question. Suppose that the system is simply isolated and, and closed and it's evolving under its own unitary dynamics. Is that sufficient to give rise to new phases? Well, in the case when the system is just undergoing um, evolution by a time-independent Hamiltonian, then generically, we expect that because of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, if the system is ergodic, then the system should just simply heat up to some thermal ensemble. And this just reduces to the uh, usual coupling to the heat bus scenario, and this is what we get um, at equilibrium. So we don't really get anything new here. But of course, we can ask the question, are there ways to get around this? And there are some ways, such as um, systems being integrable, uh, uh, where there are um, extensive number of conserved quantities, and so this scenario of thermalization to some Gibbs ensemble doesn't happen. Uh, but of course, I will not talk about this because this is rather fine-tuned. Um, there's also the concept of many-body localization, where you can have strong disorder in the system, giving rise to a so-called L-bit description, where these L-bits are just quasi-local integrals of motion, which are conserved for infinite times. And this is what can prevent thermalization, and you can get new phases which are not at equilibrium. The situation is even worse if you consider um, Floquet driving, or you might think it's even worse because in Floquet driving, when the system is, sorry, I 
too quickly. Um, in Floquet driving, when the system is undergoing dynamics by a time-dependent uh, unitary operator, there is no conserved energy anymore. So you expect that at late times, because of um, the maximizing of entropy, the system, at least at the level of subsystems, should tend towards the infinite temp temperature ensemble. So at that level, observables will not um, show any features, you will not see any long-range ordering, and you would say that this is a boring state. And so um, you might think that Fouquet driving doesn't do anything for you, uh, but of course there are ways to get around that, and similar ways as in the time-independent systems, you can have integrable systems, uh, they are still fine-tuned. You can also have Fouquet many-body localization, where strong disorder together with driving can still lead to MBL, and you can, and you can define new phases in that, that, that way. But there's also the concept of Fouquet pre-formalization, where because of some large separation of, of energy scales in the problem, for example, if you're driving at high frequencies, you might end up with some long-lived non-trivial dynamics where the system doesn't heat up to infinite temperature, where um, everything is featureless, but there is some non-trivial dynamics for some um, long time, which is parametric in some, um, some parameter in the system that you can push to arbitrarily long. And so in these two cases, MBL and Fouquet pre can possibly define um, new phases, uh, which are also Fouquet in nature. And um, you might ask, um, can, the, can Fouquet phases actually give rise to new phases of matter? And the answer is yes, because Fouquet phases has something called a discrete time translation symmetry. And this is a symmetry which relates the arguments of the driving Hamiltonian between two times. So big T here is a driving period of the Hamiltonian. And so this, this um, this relates the argument at t to t plus big T. Now you might think that this is, a, yeah, I, I can take questions, yes. Uh, so in many body localization, you have the existence of L bits, which are conserved for all times, and you're talking about pre is that right? Or? Yeah, yeah, so it's okay, so in, in, in MBL, which is either in Floquet or static systems, you have the existence of L bits, local integrals of motion, which are conserved for long times. Um, in agotic systems, which are Floquet, which are driven, you expect that at least at the level of subsystems, uh, they should heat up to infinite temperature because uh, locally there's no conservation of energy, and so there's no reason for you to expect there to be any uh, conserved charges or, or Gibbs ensemble, for example, and so things should be featureless. But in the case for Floquet pre because of a large separation on time scales or energy scales, uh, you can have a situation where it doesn't quite heat up to this infinite temperature ensemble for a long time. And there can be a, pr a plateau or a regime in which uh, dynamics is just non-trivial. And I will talk about this uh, in a bit. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, in Floquet systems, there's a notion of discrete time transition symmetry. Uh, this is not quite the usual symmetry that we think about in many body systems because usually we think of a unitary operator that acts on the Hamiltonian, and which, um, which it is invariant under. But nevertheless, this notion that there is some structure in time can give rise to bona fide physical uh, symmetries in a system later on. Um, just to flesh out a couple of examples, uh, with this notion of time transition symmetry, you can get both topological phases and spontaneous symmetry breaking phases, just like in the Landau paradigm and also the uh, topological paradigm. Um, as an example, you can have things such as the anomalous Floquet trend insulator. This is basically um, a, a system, a 2D system, let's say, uh, which is driven in such a way that you have bands uh, which are non-topologically, uh, non-topological, which means to say that if you, look, if you compute the, the trend number is zero, nevertheless, they have um, pr protected edge modes um, at zero energy and also at pi energy. And this is only possible because in Floquet systems, the quasi-energy is wrapped around uh, on a, on, on a uh, on a sphere, uh, so, so this, this can never happen in a static system. So this is completely beyond a static scenario. Of course, the most famous example of a spontaneously uh, broken uh, phase is a discrete time crystal. So this is the, the scenario where um, you can have certain Floquet systems which are driven in such a way that um, at late times, the response is uh, non, well, the system doesn't thermalize, but in, in addition, the system also does not um, responds at a subharmonic of the original driving frequency. So for example, if you put in a uh, Floquet Hamiltonian of period T, 
then out comes at late times that there is a response of some local observable, which is 2T periodic. And this is robust against uh, imperfections or robust against uh, deviations from uh, the, the perfect drive pro protocol, so, so to speak. And, and as you can see in this plot here, uh, this is one example which I put out from one of the pap papers. And they show that SZ, like if you measure SZ in the system, it undergoes 2T periodic responses for basically infinite times. They do some scaling of system size as well. Yeah, so hopefully I've convinced you that because of this extra symmetry in the system, uh, you can get new phases of matter which are not realizable in uh, time independent systems. So we, we can ask the question. Um, so given that this system has a single time transition symmetry, can there be systems with multiple time transition symmetries? Now you might say, okay, if I'm a, uh, never mind. If I'm a high energy physicist, I, I might consider uh, universes with two time directions, but we live in a real world of only one single time uh, domain, so we, can, we have to uh, think of single time Hamiltonians. Um, the natural way to generalize Floquet systems is to consider quasi periodically driven systems. So, what are they? So, these are systems which are driven by multiple drives, each of which has a fundamental frequency, uh, omega 1 to omega m, which are um, irrationally related. And by irrationally related, I mean that there is no integer vector that n, such that n dot omega, which is the sum of n, n i omega i, can be set to zero uh, if n is not zero. So this means that you cannot find any integer vector such that it is closed. Right? So uh, as a very concrete example, take two drives, and omega 1 to be 1, omega 2 to be the golden ratio. You can convince yourself that aside from n being zero and zero, there's no solution where this is uh, actually zero. So this becomes uh, interesting because it gives you more structure and time. How can I think of a quasi-periodically driven Hamiltonian? So the way to think about it is that um, there is some Hamiltonian, H of theta, that lives in a higher dimensional space. So here, this space is a torus of angles, theta 1 to theta 2. So here, I've only drawn for you two frequencies or two, two um, irrationally related frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2. But this concept generalizes to higher um, dimensional, uh, dimensional tor tori as well. So if we have a Hamiltonian which is defined on this um, torus, and here the this, this contours are just schematics of what the differences in Hamiltonians are. As you move along the torus, of course, I cannot really plot the Hamiltonian, but this is just some schematic. Then to get a quasi-periodic Hamiltonian, what I can do is that I can evaluate along a trajectory on this torus which is given by omega t, and where omega is your choice of the frequency vectors omega 1 to omega m. And if you pick omega m uh, to be, if you, if you pick the, the omega vector to be um, irrationally related, uh, then this traje trajectory will never close on itself, and instead cover the entire torus as you wrap around it. This is what defines a quasi-periodic Hamiltonian. And more generally, this is also what defines a quasi-periodic function. Uh, if, if now you, you change h to be a function on the torus, this is what it is. Now, in the lab, what you can do is that you can say, let me evaluate along this trajectory, and then you get a single time Hamiltonian, uh, h of t, which is, for example, given by this profile. And so this is your single time Hamiltonian. Uh, of course, here, if you are careful, I, I, I've used t uh, single time, and the two arguments, omega t here, uh, but this is abuse of notation, but I'm sure uh, this will be clear from context. Okay, so if you look at the single time Hamiltonian, uh, if you look at the profile, you can see that there's no pattern in, in time, or you might think that there's no pattern in time because there's no big T, there's, there's no period such that um, the Hamiltonian repeats after itself. And so you might think, okay, there's no time transition symmetry and, and the system is featureless or might be some, uh, something boring. But actually, because the dynamics de derives from this higher dimensional space, there is an underlying symmetry of the underlying Hamiltonian, which is by translations along the tori. So in this direction, x, and then in this direction, y. And this is what we will interpret as multiple time translation symmetries. And um, as of right now, it's not clear why such a symmetry on this space might affect the physical time Hamiltonian. But this will turn out to be important and actually give rise to new phases of matter. Okay, so before we can even talk about what phases we can get, we have to talk about 
heating or, and stability in quasi periodically driven systems. So you, now you're driving a system and you are driving it at, at, at um, frequencies which are basically given by n dot omega. So um, the, the input frequency is n dot omega and this quantity is dense in a real line if omega is irrational, irrationally related. Which means to say that if you look at, for example, um, say the uh, energy spectra of say uh, undriven hematonin and you drive it, then the drive will allow you to couple between energy eigenstates separated by n dot omega. And since n dot omega is, uh, can be arbitrarily small, this suggests that you can move up the ladder of energy eigenstates uh, arbitrarily uh, well, or, or you can always find a resonant condition, and so the system presumably should heat up to infinite temperature. And there will be a quick heat death and all your features will be lost and nothing will be interesting. Well, this is of course not quite a scenario and for me to explain this, let me go back to the Floquet case uh, where instead of n dot omega, I only have frequencies of n omega where n are integers. So I'm driving at, 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 at multiples of a fundamental frequency. So in this case, yes. Yeah. No, it would be flat because it's just a trace over the infinite temperature ensemble, which is, which is trace over the traceless operator, which is zero. Okay, so let's go back to the argument for why um, in Floquet systems there is slow heating. And this, this goes back to the argument by, by this paper. Um, I, I'm, let me just give you the very baby argument or the baby steps and, and say, consider a many body Hamiltonian, which is the sum of local terms. Then you just drive it weakly by some local term. Of course, eventually you want to consider many local terms, but let's say a single local term first. And say that we have high frequencies where omega is much larger than the local bandwidth of this many body Hamiltonian. Now I can um, Fourier decompose V of T in terms of the Fourier um, components Vn. Uh, so, and you can see from this formula that Vn allows you to make transitions between eigenstates of H0. Uh, separated by n omega in energy. So in terms of the picture, this is the, the scenario where v, v1 couples you from this to this, and this is omega in size, and j is basically the local bandwidth. And the way to think about local bandwidth is basically the amount of local energy that you incur or you have to um, change if you do a single spin flip in a system. So, um, and this concept of locality is very important. So now if we look at this quantity where we ask, suppose I start out with one eigenstate i, and I want to transition to eigenstate j, what is the rate? And in Fermi's golden rule, you can write this rate down. Um, but you notice that because um, ei minus ej, um, so to, to absorb a single photon uh, of, of unit n omega requires you to flip many local spins. As, as I said, j is local energy scale. So this quantity n omega over j is very large. And this is a high order process, uh, which means to say that this rate will be suppressed by an exponential factor, by, uh, by this uh, factor here, n omega over j. Now I can derive this by inserting commutators here, but this is a, a technical thing, and so let me just state that physically what's happening is that in order for you to absorb this n omega, you need to do n omega over j local flips, and this is suppressed. So as, as you know, there's a dependence on n, but you see that um, the fastest process is when n equals to one. So the heating time you expect in this system is to be going, should go as an, an exponential in frequency. And this is indeed what, what is, what is uh, the case that generically locate okay, systems driven at high frequencies are heating up, uh, barring MBL and stuff like that, if they're ergodic, they should heat up at this rate. And of course, this uh, beyond linear response arguments, this is the idea of uh, pre-thermalization, where there, there is some effective Hamiltonian description and uh, long-lived en energy conservation for such time as well. Okay, so now let's go to the quasi-periodically driven systems. And we can do the same idea where uh, we consider a weakly driven quasi-periodic term. Now we can further decompose it. Now this ends belong to um, Z, ZM, the, the set of inter integer vectors. And omega is a set of frequencies, omega 1 and omega, omega M. And once again, we assume high frequencies. But now you notice something, that N dot omega, because it's dense, can be arbitrarily small. Um, of course, there, there'll be some processes which are large compared to the local energy scale. Um, and so th this, these processes will also see uh, the exponential suppression due to locality because re you require many spin flips. But these processes can be dangerous and resonant. But the crucial point is that this quantity n dot omega cannot be too small 
uh, unless, well, the, the, in order to get, for you to get a small n dot omega requires a large vector n. And so in number theory, we can quantify exactly how small this quantity n dot omega is by this so-called Diophantine condition, which tells you that given a choice of frequency vector omega, the quantity n dot omega is larger than equals to some, um, well, it, it, it's, it's larger than, than some lower bound um, of this, uh, which goes down as n increases. And this gamma here, this exponent, is basically the number of frequencies minus one. So in the case for Floquet, this is just zero. So in the case for quasi periodic derivative systems with two frequencies, this is one, right? So putting these two concepts together, we can say that the heating rate um, is suppressed in similar considerations as previously by this factor, which is the suppression from locality. And this factor allows us to incorporate both effects because you can see that this factor is, is ineffective uh, under this condition and is effective under this condition. Now we can put in this Diophantine condition bound and put it in here and say that um, this rate is suppressed in this way. Um, and now we see that this is not great because as n increases, then potentially this can become one. But now we can see that there's another dependence on n, which is the Fourier harmonics V of n. And so we can make an assumption that V of n decays fast uh, compared to n. So if you assume smooth functions on the torus, then we get an exponential suppression. We put this assumption in, and we can minimize over n to find the fastest rate and we find that there is a stretched exponentially long heating time in, uh, at high frequencies. And this is the generic behavior that we should expect from this uh, leader response arguments. Of course, these are baby steps, but we have a theorem which allows us to prove a similar thing, such as pre thermalization and effective Hamiltonians that last for such a long time. Uh, so the statement is that given a smooth in time quasi periodic local many body Hamiltonian at high frequencies, uh, with the frequency vector obeying the, the diophantine condition, which is true for all but a set of measure zero frequency vectors, then the, the unitary time evolution operator can be decomposed into basically two parts. Uh, one part is the kick operator, uh, and one, the other part is some motion by some effective quasi-local Hamiltonian. And as you can see, uh, P of omega t is a small quasi-local unitary that is itself time quasi-periodic, and because it's small, it means that this quantity is effectively conserved for uh, such a long time. Um, v basically is a high frequency expansion uh, Hamiltonian and there's some formulas, but let me not go into them. But basically the, the, the main point of D is that, or, or the, the leading or the term of D is basically the um, time average of the driving Hamiltonian over the torus, which makes a lot of sense. Because if, if you're driving at high frequencies and the, the motion is such that it covers the entire torus, then basically it just symmetrizes over the torus. Um, okay, so what are the consequences? So basically we have consequence one, if you assume that D is an ergodic Hamiltonian, then um, if you look at the local observable, let's say O, what we will see is that generically, if you begin from something which is out of equilibrium compared to D, the system will, um, in this frame, uh, if, it's, if you only care about this evolution, it will, um, have transients and eventually reach a steady state and basically thermalize to the Gibbs ensemble of D. But in the lab frame, when we actually have to put back in this P of omega T, this means that there is non-trivial quasi-periodic micromotion on top of this steady state. Okay, so consequence two is that if you can assume that D is many body localized, um, then we have kind of a scenario where we have quasi-periodic MBL. Um, and this is a very peculiar type of MBL. So um, just as a very quick sentence of what MBL is, uh, MBL is the, the idea that there's an existence of a complete set of L bits, L uh, integrals of motion, which commute with D, and, and they are quasi-local, and, and, and you can specify all eigenstates by them. So now if you look at a motion of tau z, or specifically if you dress it up slightly, you find that this dress version of tau z is quasi-periodic in time. So this is a new form of um, MBL in which uh, the L bits are actually not actually conserved quantities, but they're just moving in time. Of course, if you look at the L bits moving in forward time, so, so previously I've been looking at backwards time, where this is U and U dagger, but in forwards time, then basically these modified L bits are not exactly quasi-periodic, but they come back to themselves arbitrarily close. Uh, 
you can find a sequence of times when they come back to themselves. So the, the physical picture is that the L bits are not conserved at any time, but it, they, they spread and reface and spread and reface and spread and reface. Okay, so now uh, I've talked to you about no thermalization or slow thermalization in such systems. And now let me get to the, to the um, talk about symmetries and what phases you can get once you have such results. So can there be fundamentally non-equivalent phases from quasi particle driven systems? And once again, since there are multiple tra time transition symmetries, you might expect there to be topological and also spontaneous symmetry breaking phases. Um, well, let's look at the simplest case where we just look at a high, direct high frequency limit. Take a system, drive it at high frequencies. And because of a result, it says that the, the unitary time evolution operator has some effective Hamiltonian description, where the, these unitaries are very small. So for, for all purposes, we can just drop them and say that the time evolution is just given by some time independent Hamiltonian. But this is just static time evolution. So nothing really new here, and we don't really learn anything new here. So that's an important point I want to make is that if you want to figure out new phases matter which are fundamentally non-equilibrium, you should instead look for descriptions of U of T which are not as expressible as exponential or some static Hamiltonian. And additionally, you, can, you might have to show that there's some sort of stability and some sort of um, slow heating so that the system just, just doesn't blow up in your face. And now let me describe to you one example which is a time quasi-crystal example. So uh, I, I, like the theory is general, but let me focus on one specific example because uh, otherwise it's very hard to tell in full generality. So imagine that we have a bunch of spins, interacting spins in two spatial dimensions. And I've written for you only the Hamiltonian in the torus space, not the physical space, but you can always say that I'm evaluating it along the trajectory. Now it consists of two parts. One, a time quasi-periodic spin flip. So this, uh, ignore the one here, this is just sigma x. So you're just flipping the spin, but in a fashion which is governed by f of theta, and f of theta is the amplitude of the spin flip. And I also allow there to be interactions between the spins, and they are arbitrary. Now, f of theta is basically, um, I can choose it to be some function which is scaling with omega. And this part here, f of tilde, is, is a zero time average of this function, and it also scales with omega. So you would say that this system is strongly driven, and it's beyond a high frequency limit because uh, this doesn't make sense if the couplings are also scaling with frequency. Um, instead of telling you exactly what this function is, let me just draw it for you and say that this is perhaps an example of what we have in mind. Uh, this is a function f of theta, and this is a torus uh, picture where f of theta lives here. Uh, you can see that this it is symmetric under, under translations by 2 pi this way, and if you evaluate along this direction, this red curve basically pick, picks up some amplitude, and if you look at it in physical time, some large amplitude. Um, so you're flipping the spins according to this protocol. Now, I mentioned that this system is beyond a, a high frequency limit, but you can rectify that by actually going into the frame of reference of the spin flips. And in, in doing so, you define this um, rotating frame transformation U of zero of T, which you can express once again in this particular scenario as um, the evaluation of a function on the torus uh, at omega t. So this is non-trivial, but in this case, you can find that there exists that this rotating frame transformation can be re-expressed as a function on a higher dimensional torus. Uh, one thing to note is that this function uh, is still periodic, but it's not periodic under translations by 2 pi in x or y. And in the interaction frame, so you define the interaction frame Hamiltonian, so now everything is local and everything is like has uh, small energy and so it's high frequency, it's periodic, so it emits a effective Hamiltonian expansion just like in what I described. And so for all purposes we can say that there's some effective Hamiltonian D that governs the dynamics. And here I'm dropping the, the micro motion P of T to make life simpler. And so your, 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 your unitary time evolution operator comprises of two parts. A large uh, rotating frame transformation and a time independent um, you know, interacting Hamiltonian. Why is this useful? So let me consider for you, <clears throat> oh, well, okay, so before going to that, why, why is useful? Let me tell you more about the time transition symmetries in the system, which I have so far not talked about. So recall once again that the original driving Hamiltonian had a time transition symmetry, which is given by the translations along x or y by 2 pi of a unit vector, and it comes back to itself. But because of this transformation, you can show that there's something non-trivial that happens. If you translate the, the interaction Hamiltonian by um, x or y, 
uh, 2 pi times uh, unit vector 1 uh, in the x direction and, and 2 pi times unit vector in the y direction, then what pops up is that there's a symmetry action, x diagonal x. And this is highly non-trivial because it says that it's relating the, the argument of this interaction Hamiltonian by the action of a symmetry. And this is what we call a twisted time transition symmetry. And so this is basically the, the, the manifestation of the original time transition symmetries on the twisted time transition symmetries. And now I have a point that I want to make, which is, uh, which is magical, uh, but you have to uh, trust me on this, which is that if you now plug this condition into our high frequency expansion, the one that I promised that we have a, re a rigorous result on, it turns out that this non-trivial fact, the fact that there's a relation between different arguments and the action of a symmetry, ensures that the effective Hamiltonian is always symmetric under X. And this is an emergent symmetry. Now, I haven't explained this, but uh, it's a bit hard to explain it un unless I go through the actual expansion. But the key point I want to say is that this is a very non-trivial result because I have not assumed anything about symmetries in this original Hamiltonian. And yet, there is an emergent symmetry that comes out. So, and this symmetry is basically the manifestation of the original time trans translation symmetries. And this is why we call this a protection by this time translation symmetries. Now, let me just tell you the physical consequences. Yeah. Okay, so assume that we have this, this decomposition where now we know additionally that D commutes with X, so it's symmetric. We look at the time evolution of an initial state measured in some local observable, like, let's say SZ, which is odd under, under the, the symmetry, then we can rewrite it as two parts. One, I, I group the face, uh, the rotating frame transformations onto the order parameter, and one, um, the interaction Hamiltonian, uh, um, evolution on the state. And because this remains a local operator in time, now I can invoke the idea that um, this part here will basically thermalize to a thermal state um, that, is, that, that reproduces the expectation values at some temperature. Um, so this is, of course, this state here is never uh, going to thermalize in the pure state in the full Hilbert space sense, but at least at the level of local observable, observables, I can replace it by the um, thermal state or the, the equilibrium state rho here. And you notice that this expression can be rewritten as some function on the torus evaluated along some trajectory. The crucial point here now is that because of this um, rotating frame transformations, you notice that the periodicity of this S of theta depends crucially on whether rho, this steady state, spontaneously breaks the Z2 symmetry or not. Notice that U0 at specific times pops out an X operator, and you see that the state rho will transform under the X if you transfer it over this side, and this state will now then pick up um, either a phase factor or not a phase factor. So more formally, I would say this. Does rho spontaneously break the symmetry? So if it does, I'm sorry, if it does not, it means that it's symmetric. And so every time there's an X that pops out at specific times, it just vanishes, the action is trivial. And so this function's periodicity is the same as the original driving Hamilton's periodicity. And so we would say that the time trans translation symmetry is unbroken, and this is a trivial phase. But on the other hand, if the symmetry is not spontaneously broken, sorry, it is spontaneously broken, then there's a row which transforms non-trivially, and you see that this function is no longer periodic under the same translation symmetries of the original driving Hamiltonian. And this is a symmetry broken phase, which we'll call a time quasi-crystal. And why is it a time quasi-crystal? Quasi-crystal, as, you, as you, some of you might know, is a projection of a higher dimensional crystal on a lower dimensional space. So let me just draw some pictures. We have the original drive Hamiltonian given by this profile. You're driving your spins this way. And what pops out in S of theta, if you measure it that way, happens to be uh, this function in time, which you can understand as deriving from a pattern on the torus or the extended space, uh, which has a different periodicity. Notice that the unit cell is now this unit cell, which is different from the unit cell of this guy. And, and so this is a change in your periodicity, and it is a change in the structure in, uh, of, the, of, of time. Um, this two profiles are not very uh, well, if you look at it, you can't really tell what is what, but of course, if you do a Fourier transform, you can see it much easier. So if you do a Fourier transform of this, or, or if you look at the power spectra of these two functions, there's a noticeable difference. So the drive basically is 
has frequencies of n dot omega. So you're driving the, the, the system at these frequencies. The response in this symmetry broken case happens to be alpha dot omega, where alpha are the reciprocal lattice vectors of the larger lattice. And you notice that alpha um, is not the same as n. Basically, alpha is a fraction of n. And if you look at the um, uh, Fourier transform, you can find that, hmm, yeah, you can find that there are distinct peaks. The A1 and A2 are the Fourier content of the drive, and B1 and B2, B3 are the, uh, are the, are the uh, response functions. And they are very distinct, and you can see how that they are distinct. And this is stable, of course. So now as a very last uh, two slides, let me just say that top in topological phases, uh, we can also get new phases. Uh, so if you, if you go back to MBL and the systems, um, you, I said that D has tau Zs which are conserved. So if you take a simultaneous eigenstate of tau Zs and you evolve it in time, then you notice that U of T of this simultaneous eigenstate of tau Zs is quasi-periodic in time. And so this induces a map from the torus Tm to the space of ground states because uh, basically tau, psi, psi is the MBL, area, uh, MBL state, eigenstate, which is area law entangled, and so on. And so this is the map from TM to the space of gap ground states. And we can classify this, and there are good reasons to believe that um, this, this map, if you include a symmetry group of G, which is internal, uh, uh, reduces to the classification of equilibrium phases with symmetry group G cross ZM. And, 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 and you can, therefore, you can get new phases protected by this, these multiple time transition symmetries. Uh, of course, we need to write down explicit examples. So, okay, very good. Um, summary, uh, I've told you that driven systems with particular symmetries or structure in time, together with a statement of a lack of heating, can give rise to novel phases of matter, which are like time quasi-crystals or quasi-periodic symmetry protected and enriched topological phases. And as an outlook, we're now looking into the numerical investigations of this. Uh, you need to somehow evolve it in a different way. Uh, we need to write down explicit examples of quasi periodic phases. Uh, we can also ask how much of these uh, smooth functions, the, the, the part where the Fourier coefficients decay exponentially, can we relax? Um, can we actually prove that there's MBL beyond the high frequency expansion? And maybe we can, we can consider long range interactions and baths as well. Okay, with that, I thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, questions or comments? Yes. Thanks a lot. So the, this uh, quasi-periodic MBL, yeah. uh, do you expect this to eventually heat up? So this, I mean, you, you, is it a transient phenomenon or, or, or not actually? Yeah, so in this uh, language, we are using the fact that we can employ a high frequency expansion on top of the fact that it's disordered. So we're assuming that there's a hierarchy of scales where omega is larger than the disorder, which itself is larger than any other energy scales in the system. And so from this theorem, we would just say that this description should just last for, I mean, we, it's, it's, it's only a lower bound, but we would say that this lasts for this um, stretch exponentially long time. But if you're asking, can we actually prove that there's MBL, which is not dependent on some high frequency Expansion, then I, I think it's an open question. I don't know. But if you ask different people, then pe different people will say different things. Some people say, yes, of course it exists, and some people will say, uh, well, maybe not. But at least in this result, we can show that it is stable up to some long time. Other questions or comments? Transition symmetries is broken and not the other. Yeah. Those yeah. can be recovered the original time. Uh, yes, but in this case, it's, it's the same symmetry generator. So, Three. yeah, because here, here there's only one symmetry that emerges, effective Hamiltonian. So, thanks for that point. So, I, I, in the example, I gave only a single symmetry generator. But it turns out that uh, you can play around with this, you can drive it in different ways, and you can get multiple symmetries in the effective Hamiltonian. So you can break multiple symmetries um, at the same time, uh, some of them or none of them. And this, this gives rise to a huge zoo of phases. Questions or comments? 
Okay, if you not, let's thank speaker again.